going to be in the middle and then a ending a teaching time. And I trust that you will be encouraged as we begin tonight. Um, you may wonder, huh, why are we worrying about Leviticus chapter 23 and the festivals? Um, sometimes I'm concerned that we have forgotten the Jewishness of our faith, our Jewish roots, and it adds such richness. God did choose a particular people group to magnify himself and to reveal himself through. And when we understand that, we goyim, uh, we Gentiles, it brings a great richness to our faith and I've learned that over the years and want to share that. If you recall back in um, uh, March we learned about Passover and I told you then that that was the start of the new year. Well I'm going to confuse you again tonight because you may be saying wait a minute I think some of my Jewish friends just celebrated new year and that was just last Friday. Well that's true. There's a couple different calendars. So just kind of like think about we have our beginning of the year in January but a lot of us feel like the fall this time a year we're going back to school and stuff a new year's beginning we have all different kind of calendars well in the Jewish system there are several different calendars but this is their calendar the first of the uh, month is called Nisan around to the 12th month now Nisan uh, is usually falls around our March and April and then now we're in Tishri the seventh month, which comes in September, October. The calendar is a lunar calendar for that, so it's kind of always changing, but roughly in the, that period of time. Um, I want us to think about the word holiday. It is from the root of holy day. God is the one that instituted holidays holy days. And unfortunately, we've spent a lot of our time now in holidays thinking about anything but God and maybe even a little ashamed of some of the activities that we do do on these supposedly holidays. But tonight I want us to think about that and think about the feasts. God instituted seven particular feasts and we use the word feast, but really the Hebrew word for th that's translated feast is the phrase God's appointed time. God appointed certain times throughout the year because he knew we needed to have reminders to come back to him and these appointed times would aid our walk with him. So we have, he instituted, this is just the, the verse in Exodus chapter 12, um, when he instituted that the first of the year would begin in Nisan. But then we come around, that's when the sacred calendar begins. But then we have the civil calendar beginning now at this time of the year in the fall. But the first feast that I want to just remind us of is a weekly Sabbath. It is a weekly Sabbath, and even Sabbaths are a time that God said, no work, no work. He knew, and boys and Americans, we love, we're proud of our work, right? Work, 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 work. And God said, no, no work. I want you to do no work and think about me. Remember to rest and remember God as a creator and his covenants. With each of the feasts, even with Sabbath, there is a looking backwards and a looking forward. And with most every feast that God instituted, he gives us the specific reason. I want you to set apart this day, no work, do something special because, and he tells us, there's one exception and I'll come to that a little bit later. But even the Sabbath, the, our weekly Sabbath, has a looking back, we rest, we remember that God created the world and even he rested. And then we look forward to Christ, our real rest giver in the kingdom to come and the true Sabbath that we're still yet to participate in. Just a quick reminder then of the first four feasts that we had. We, we talked about Passover back in March. Passover, then the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of the First Fruits, and then 50 days later we had the Feast of Pentecost. And I don't have time to go through this tonight, but if you know your Bibles and know a little bit about the history, as you look at each of these feasts, they all line up with a point in time of the life of Christ. 
and the beginning of the church, of course, is associated with Pentecost. There's a major thing with Christ, of course, our Passover, our unleavened bread. The first fruits is what? The resurrection. Jesus rose from the grave on the festival of first fruits. Is that a coincidence? I don't think so. God's got a plan. So that's the first four, but then we come down into this season that we're in right now. As I mentioned, Feast of Trumpets, our Jewish friends just celebrated this last Thursday, uh, last Friday, the Feast of Trumpets, also known as Rosh Hashanah, which means the head of the new year. Um, that term Rosh Hashanah is not in the Bible. The Bible calls it the Feast of Trumpets, and then we have the Day of Atonement, followed right up with the Feast of Tabernacles or Booths. Three of these, seven feasts, God said, I want you, if you are a Jewish male of the right age, You've got to come up to Jerusalem and celebrate these feasts in Jerusalem. So three times a year, all the men of, Jer of Israel, wherever you were, you were commanded, even out of the country, to come up. The first one is Passover, and then Pentecost, and then the last one is Tabernacles and Booths. Now, we're going to begin by focusing on the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets starts the civil year on Tishri the 1st. And, of course, how can we not start a little talk about the Feast of the Trumpets without our very own trumpeter, Sean Davis? <laughs> now, as he's coming, I want you to know that um, the, the trumpet, the Feast of Trumpets, uh, is called that. It's a ram's horn, and it was used to sound as a call to repent. And also, it was a blast about the king is coming. The king is coming. So is there something yet future in our history, O oh beloved, that we need to yet still have fulfilled? is the return of Jesus, the King. So a lot of Bible scholars see we're not into predictions here. We're not because the Bible tells us that no one knows, not even the Son of Man, when Christ is going to come again. But there's a lot of us that kind of get excited every fall thinking, could this be the season? Could this be the one? Because our king is supposed to come again. And so they would sound the shofar. And Sean, what is the shofar? The shofar is a instrument that is created from a ram's horn, an actual live animal. And there is a lot of symbolism pertaining to it. Um, we hear or see uh, the ram in the Akedah in Hebrew, which means the binding of Isaac. And with the blowing of the shofar, it, it represented, um, come to attention. It was used to celebrate. It was used to prepare the children to enter into battle, uh, to war. And also it is a spiritual warfare instrument by our Heavenly Father. And there are so many other things in which the shofar has and is being used for. And I'm one who's learning, as we all are. And I truly appreciate being here tonight, being an honor as my sister's talking about these feasts because I'm learning about them at um, the church I go to. And it is eye-opening and is refreshing. This past Sunday, I had an opportunity to celebrate uh, Yom, um, it's Rosh Hashanah with some Orthodox Messianic Jews. Hmm. And it, it was different. And what they did was it was a lot of prayer and it was a lot of shofar playing. A lot of prayer and a lot of shofar playing and it was something I appreciate being exposed to because we have so many in the body of Christ but they may not all worship the same as we worship but it's still the same God mm -hmm. and there is a beauty to it there was a beauty in the explanation about how the food was arranged and what was consumed first 
And I took away at the end of it, above all things, and I'll put a period on it. Our God is a God of mercy. Amen. He's a God of mercy. That's He's a rich in mercy. That's a great note to end on, but we're going to have Sean play, and as he gets, I, I have had the privilege to try to play one of these things. They stink. I'll let, just let you know that. I don't know. <laughs> you have to kind of get uh, that worn out over time, I think. But there are um, four particular sounds that the Jews, uh, Jewish people use in the synagogue. There's a long blast. There's a short blast. Because you, you don't, um, there's staccatos and then a long blast that kind of increases in sound. And so there are sounds that they use, they, that they're, that they remember. Now, I told you that each of the feasts looks backwards and looks forward. This is the one feast that God did not explain what it looks back to. It's a mystery. Whoops. We'll get to that. I have my slides out of order. It's a mystery. Hang on to that. But Sean, can you um, play for us now and tell us about the notes? Absolutely. This first one is called... Um, Oh, hold on. <laughs> That's all right. Takata. Takata. It is that, that long first note that you had just mentioned. There's Takata, there's Shivarim, there's Turua, and there's Takata Gedala, which is the last one. So okay. I'm going to play them in order. Put the mic down, Mark. I don't think we need it. No, it's loud. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sean, for sharing that with us. And so I want you not to just think when you hear that, when you come to RTO, that's a call. It's a call for us to remember to take this time as we gather together to rejoice together. Take it seriously, but also be reminded that our king is coming. Our king is coming. And um, Sean mentioned that... Uh, the ram's horn is symbolic in during this feast they usually read in the synagogue genesis chapter 22 where abraham goes to a sacrifice isaac and what does god do he provides a ram it provides a ram. So some people think, remember I told you this was the one feast that's kind of a mystery. Actually, I was reading some literature from an ancient rabbi and he, he called this the mysterious feast because God didn't say do this because you're going to remember this. There's a mystery about why the trumpets. And so today um, they believe some, it's become tradition that some believe that Isaac was sacrificed or uh, Abraham went to sacrifice Isaac on Rosh Hashanah, and so that's why they read Genesis 22. But another scripture that they read on Rosh Hashanah is Micah 7.19. And Micah 7.19 says, He will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. And there is a, um, a little tradition, a ritual that they call Tashlich, where they'll actually go down to a body of flow water it's got to be flowing water and take bread and cast and remind themselves that God casts off our sin and they'll cast it off now if they don't live near a flowing water sometimes they will put buckets 
uh, in big buckets and they'll come and they'll cast into that. And, and I always think of Corey Ten Boom's quote that God talks, she tells people that God removes our sins and casts them out and then puts up a sign, no fishing here. And I've, I've sometimes wondered, did she see Tash Leach being observed in her, the Jewish community around her? And, and is that why that came up? But they observed this Tash Leach. Of course, in today, in the synagogues, when it's celebrated, they have um, over 100 times the shofar is sounded as part of the, the different services. So can you imagine? That takes a lot of power. If any of you have tried blowing a trumpet, you should try blowing a ram's horn, too. It's really... But um, so the ram's horn, the Feast of Trumpets, think about this. It's a mysterious feast. And then Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. And then he also wrote, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So again, we don't know, we're not predicting, we're not saying God is not tied into ours, but boy, it would sure make sense, wouldn't it? In his economy, we've seen that he would tell Christ to come back as we're getting ready to celebrate the Feast of the Trumpets. That's the future-looking part of this particular feast. Now, this brings us to what's going to happen next in our seasonal calendar, the Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur, or the Day of Affliction. A lot of these holidays have many different names. So as you're studying your Bible, and you're getting confused, and you're thinking, I can't keep this all straight, you're in good company. <laughs> Take notes, write it down, because it's really hard to keep these all straight, because some Bible translations will call it this, some Jewish people call it that. It's all talking about the same thing. We've got Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, Day of Affliction. It looks back and it recalls God's only method of atoning for sins is through the offering of a living sacrifice. This year, Yom Kippur begins on Sunday, this coming Sunday, September 24th. It appears in scripture, the specific instructions for this are given to us in Leviticus 23 and 25. It is to be regarded as a Sabbath, so that's why you have to get used to this idea of Sabbath, because sometimes Sabbath does, doesn't apply to what we think of Saturdays. Sabbath means you're doing no work. You're setting aside this day as a really holy day. And just as a joke, um, I heard the guy that leads uh, Chosen People Ministry of Ministry to the Jewish people, he said that's why Jewish bus businesses, a lot of Jewish people have to go in business for themselves because they're always taking days off. And <laughs> so um, he said that, not me. <laughs> but um, it's, at certain times a year, there are a lot of days to be set aside. And Yom Kippur is definitely one of those. Now every 50 years on Yom Kippur supposedly was to be the year of Jubilee and the sounding of the shofar then began to mark the year of Jubilee when debts were canceled and slaves were set free. There were different things that happened in the year of Jubilee and it was kind of like a really big reset. Uh, Unfortunately, it appears that the Jewish people never celebrated and never followed the year of Jubilee. 
But it is interesting that that concept is kind of foundational for our country's idea of bankruptcy. Comes from this biblical idea of getting a reset and getting a start over. Well, that comes from the blowing of the horn at the end of the Day of Atonement. The word um, atonement, Yom Kippur, Kippur comes from a couple different words, and I thought this was so cool as I studied the word. One of them is a verb that means to form a protective perimeter around a vulnerable interior. So you're trying to protect something that's vulnerable, you build this perimeter. It also is a noun for the price of a human life. So buying back when somebody was bought, and it wasn't just their buying out of slavery, included in that was the maintenance of that person. Not just their being redeemed, but their maintaining the maintenance of the person. And then, of course, it's also the word, the technical term for the seat of the mercy seat that's on the Ark of the Covenant. We'll talk about that in a second. In ancient times, the priest, here's a little de depiction of the tabernacle that God, when he instituted all of this, they didn't have the temple yet, but the tabernacle that they used in the wilderness. You have here the gate to enter in, the courtyard, and then the building in the back, the tent building in the back, was where the action took place on the Day of Atonement. This is a little diagram to remind us that that tent structure was divided kind of like two-thirds and a one-third. The front two-thirds was called the holy place. The back one-third is the most holy place. Only priests were allowed to enter the holy place. Only the high priest was allowed in the most holy place one day a year on the Day of Atonement. So we have a very special time going on in this. Here's a kind of like a little cross section of what that would look like. You've got the courtyard, then the holy place, and then the holy of holies here. So in ancient times, the high priest, he would don his holy garments. He would sacrifice a bull for himself first because he was a sinner. And in order to even come into the presence, he needed to have his and his family's sins atoned for. So he would sacrifice, make an atonement for himself. Then he would move into making an atonement for the people. And that involved two goats. And they would bring the goats in, and I think that when this person made the little model, if you can see there's up under there, there's two little goats, I think. That's what they were trying to uh, depict there. He would choose by lot. They would choose one for the Lord to be sacrificed, and then the other was designated as the scapegoat. We're all kind of familiar with that term. This is where it comes from, the scapegoat. He would also, um, that designation would be made, but as he would get ready to go into uh, the Holy of Holies, he would take some of the blood from his sacrifice of the bull, mix it with the incense and the fire from that sacrifice, and create a cloud of smoke to cover the mercy seat, because that's where God dwelt. And even he coming in, as prescribed by God, shouldn't be able to see the presence of God. And so this, this sweet smell um, incense would be creating and filling that place as well. And so here's a, just an artist's depiction based on that. This is the mercy seat where the Ark of the Covenant is. And God said, I will dwell in this. In the, between the angels, the cherubim that looked down there, and here was where the blood was applied. He would sprinkle the blood seven times, the blood from the bull of his own sin, and then the blood from the goat. He would sprinkle that seven times. Then he would move back out to the goats, and the goat that remained alive, he would place his hands on the goat and confess the sins of the people. And I love in Leviticus chapter 16, it actually uses three different terms, kind of covers everything. He would confess the sins, the transgressions, the iniquities, all of it for the people. 
and then they would take the goat and somebody would lead the goat out and send it off into the wilderness. <laughs> And folks, this is a beautiful picture. This has really just been striking me in the last several days as I've been thinking again about this. God doesn't just forgive us. He removes our sin. And I think maybe in prison ministry, we get a little leg up on this because, you know, we, we, we deal with people. We just got a phone call the other day. Would you write me a letter? I'm thinking about, you know, I'm applying to have my record expunged. The person's been forgiven, done their time, paid their penalty, and this is some years later. They want it removed. Well, this is the picture that God has done for us. What a merciful God we serve. He doesn't just forgive, but then he removes. And he took two goats and commanded them to give us our little pea brains to begin to get that picture that this is what's involved in our atonement. So how do the Jewish people today, though, observe Yom Kippur without the temple? They don't have a mercy seat that was destroyed in 70 AD. Um, today, th there's lots of ceremonies that go on in the synagogue. They uh, call it a time of affliction because that is a scriptural uh, time uh, term that's used. It's a time of self-denial. They refrain, they fast for the day, and they refrain from other things um, that would bring pleasure. And the main theme is repentance. And um, during this uh, time, they also sometimes do acts of charity. And they're big because they're thinking about repentance. They're thinking about what do I need to confess? What have I done wrong? How have I offended God? What are my relationships like? But then how can I atone for that? And so there's lots of acts of charity that go on. But for us, um, boy, we remember <laughs> that not only does Day of Atonement look back, but it also looks forward that Christ has completed our atonement for us. It is done. It is done. And folks, remember, that's the significance of when Christ issued those words from the cross. It is finished. The work is done. And then you remember, you saw there was a big thick veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place. The scriptures tell us that when Christ was crucified and he died and gave up his spirit, that veil in the temple was rent in two. We have free access now into the presence of God to come and have a relationship with God. I just want us to think about some of that. What does the Day of Atonement? And think about this, folks. This is coming up. This is part, this is what's been churning in me. You know, because some of this is like, oh, this is similar to Passover, you know, and here God institutes us again. Can we stop and think about our atonement too much? I don't think we think about it enough. And so it's my encouragement to you. Manny and I are struggling this year. We're trying to observe, we're not doing well, in really observing a Sabbath, observing Sabbath rest. Now, I'm not saying that we have to go and start observing these feasts. But keep in mind as Sunday approaches that our Jewish friends are celebrating the Day of Atonement. Let's think about the cost of Christ and what he did for us. And here's some of the symbolism to think about. These verses are all taken from Hebrews chapter 9. When Christ came as a high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made, that is to say, not a part of this creation. He is other than. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves. Abraham and the other high priests, they had to enter first with their own sacrifice being taken care of first. Christ didn't need to do that because he's already perfect. He didn't enter that way. But he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. No more atonement is needed, nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. 
but now he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Hallelujah, Hallelujah indeed. And then there's even some that take this verse and think, but Hebrews 10, 12 tells us, but when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. So you might hear some preachers say, has God added a new piece of furniture into the tabernacle? There are no seats, there are no stools, there is no sitting, because there's work to be done. There's sacrifices and fires to be lit and tables to be maintained and lamps to be filled. But now we have Christ. Has a new piece of furniture been added? He's sitting at the right hand of God because it is finished. And I want us to think about that. Think about that this Sunday as it comes. The, now here's some quotes from Sinclair Ferguson. The work of atonement took place in the presence of the God of heaven. Indeed, it involved a transaction within the fellowship of the persons of the eternal trinity in their love for us. The Son was willing, with the aid of the Spirit, to experience the hiding of the Father's face. The shedding of the blood of God's Son opened the way to God for us. That is both the horror and the glory of our great high priest's ministry. And then he ended this article saying, take time to meditate long and hard on this aspect of Christ's priesthood and on its implications. We heard Michael tell us last week about running the race. Running the race, well, if we keep in mind that this is the kind of sacrifice and what went into our atonement, boy, then we're going to be able to keep that in mind on those days when running that race is difficult. And that verse comes from Hebrews, too, the running the race. So um, I thought, right now, we have to sing. And because we have to respond to this. So let's stand. This is a great song. And as we sing these songs, I don't know what the uh, songwriter had in mind. But take it, pay attention to the words here. Go ahead, Heather, that's all right. What love could remember? No wrongs we have done. Omniscience will know. He counts not their son thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. What patience would wait as we constantly roam? What father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is of kindness he lavished on us his blood was the payment his life was the cost we stood neath a debt we could never afford our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the lord his mercy is more Praise the Lord. 
Amen. Amen. Our sins, they are many. Thank you. You may be seated. His mercy is more. So think about that. Think about that on Sunday. Remember, try to remember, ah, today's the day of atonement. We don't have to wait just to Easter to think about the atonement. And then think about the implications of how does that impact how I'm living my life. That brings us to our last festival for the season, and that is Sukkot, also called the Feast of the Ingathering, or the Feast of Tabernacles, or the Feast of Booths. So again, if you're trying to keep these all straight and you hear all these different names and get confused, that's all right, because it can be confusing. But the feast recalls that our forefathers lived as nomads, wandering for 40 years. It also recalls God's pervasive presence, that he was with them through the wilderness. And again, thinking about God's mercy, we've mentioned this in the last couple of weeks, but you know, they wandered in the wilderness as a punishment, but yet God went with them. And he provided for them, for their shoes not to wear out, for their food not to wear out. And so they remember this um, by building sukkahs, which are little tabernacles, little tents, little dwelling places. And um, it's a, also a harvest celebration. That's where the recalling God's pervasive presence comes in. And here's just an example of sukkahs can come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. They're built. I asked Bob if he ever built a sukkah as he was little. And um, he gave me the answer that a lot of people did. He's like, no, but they, they lived down the street. Well, he lived close to the temple and the rabbi's family. They built it, so they used theirs. Um, and sometimes that happens. But they typically have t at least two walls. They've got to have two walls, three, three walls, ideally, because th you are to live in this sukkah for the week. And um, so some very observant Jews will actually do that. They will go and live in the sukkah so they can be kind of elaborate. Here's one. I like this view showing at night. Um, but always with some natural elements. You can see the big palm frans laying on the top on the roof. And one of the requirements for the sukkah is that you have to be able to see the stars. You have to be able to see the stars. So this was interesting because this is a, a, an apartment building in a very Jewish quarter in Jerusalem. If you notice, the balconies are staggered so that when it comes time to build the sukkahs, they all have a little view to the sky. If they were like, we usually build our buildings, everybody's balcony is all one right down underneath the other, and that wouldn't work, because you've got to be able to see the sky. And so here's some of the architecture that takes in mind, okay, we've got to build our sukkahs, and there are sukkahs on some of the, the uh, balconies there. So the tradition requires that it be kind of flimsy, but yet sturdy enough to live in. The roof has to be able to see the stars. And um, during this time, they do what is called, and Bob, I, can you come and help me now? They do what is called the waving of the luvlov and the etrog. Do you know the blessing in Hebrew? I didn't ask you that. <laughs> I remember this, though. Do you, re you remember this? Well, this is funny because I was cheap. To get the real thing is they're very expensive because this fruit, the etrog, is very, is very expensive. But praise God for Jewish people that like to have their children have toys. It looks good enough to eat. <laughs> So you have a citrus fruit and the um, three greens, the God, God actually, if you go and read Leviticus, read it, God actually tells them to take this. And so they bind the greens together using some of the palm as the container and the citron. Now, if I remember correctly, this is supposed to, when the blessing is said, I don't know why, but the 
The stem's supposed to be pointed down as the blessing begins, and by the time the blessing is over, it's up. You say the blessing, and then you put them together. Got mine. And then we wave them. Okay. Do you remember how we wave them? Uh, like this, I think. You no, know, well, we go, we, <laughs> we should be facing east. We're not gonna do that, because we don't wanna be impolite and turn our backs to you. But you start out facing east, and it's three times to the east, then the south, then the west, then the north, and then over our heads and down to our feet because this is in remembrance of God's all pervasive care. And I mean, so we're going to do this. We're going to do it three times. And so this is the waving. So we go one, two, three. That's for the east. One, two, three to the south. Up, up, up. And it's supposed to be in your left hand. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. No, well, the atrag is in your left hand. I get it. One, two, three, over the shoulder to the west. One, two, three, to the north. One, two, three, overhead. And one, two, three, under our feet. Oh. And this is done every morning of the Feast of Sukkah. Wow. And it's typically done in the home of the Feast. So thank you, Bob. You're <laughs> So that's called the lulav and the etrog. The whole thing kind of together is called the lulav because that's all four. And that represents, it's a reminder of God's provision and his also being all encompassing around us. This feast obviously also looks forward to Christ. The feast of tabernacles. Because here are some scriptures. John 1, 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt, tabernacled among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten, uh, full of grace and truth. And even that phrase, grace and truth, was pointing to God. Now, there's another fulfillment of this. When Jesus celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles, and he did do this, he made one of his greatest and most profound announcements about his identity as Messiah in John chapter 7. On the seventh day of the Feast of Tabernacles, it was the custom of the Jewish people during this period to send a group of the Levites down to the Pool of Siloam to gather running water, maybe because of the Micah verse, and they would bring that water to the altar, and they would march around the altar seven times, and they would cry out, Lord, save us, Lord, save us, and then they would pour the water from the vessels at the base of that altar. This act symbolized the hope of the Jewish people looking forward toward the day when Messiah would come and pour out his spirit, and so the ancient rabbi cite this, Joel 2, 28 and 29, it will come about after this, that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind, and your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions, even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. According to Jewish tradition, then, these events were to take place when Messiah appeared on the earth. And John chapter 7 tells us that when Jesus was in Jerusalem for the temp feast of the tabernacles, he stood and declared, if anyone is thirst, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. He did this, and John actually says, on the greatest day, the last day of the festival. We, if you don't know this, we just script, how many years did I just read that? Well, last day, great day, you know. But, and now we understand, you know, some people say, well, Jesus never claimed to be God. Oh, yes, he did. Right with this statement. You won't read in the Bible, Jesus said, I am God. But as he stands there, he knew what they were looking for. He knew with this water ceremony, the pouring out of water, that they were looking for it. And then Jesus comes and says, I'm the one that will give you living water. You will never thirst again. Amen. Even the response, John tells, tells us, many from the crowd said, truly this is the prophet. Others said, 
this is the Christ. They knew what he was saying. And since the Feast of Tabernacles is one of the festivals where everybody was required to be there, a lot of people heard this message. So, Sukkot looks forward, it looks backwards, it looked forward to Christ, but for us, there's another Sukkot coming. The prophet Zechariah talks about a time when God will fight and defend his people when the nations gather against Jerusalem. And he says that they'll go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and keep the Feast of Tabernacles. It shall be that whichever the families of the earth don't come up to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, on them there will be no rain. God's going to judge them for not coming and keeping the festival. If the family of Egypt will not come up and enter in, they shall have no rain. They shall receive the plague with which the Lord strikes the nations who do not come up to keep the feast of tabernacles. There's a final feast, a final incoming, a final ingathering that's coming, folks. So this is again the, the finish of Zechariah. The tabernacles is a time of harvesting. It's a time of winnowing. And we know that when God comes again and Christ returns, there's going to be the separation. Those that love him and those that have rejected him. The harvest is coming and the feast of tabernacles reminds us of that as well. There's a final coming. But once that judgment takes place, here's the good news for those of us that have trusted in Christ. This winnowing is going to happen. The nations will be judged. But here's the end of the story. Revelation 21, 3 to 4. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death, neither will there be longer be any mourning, or crying, or pain, the first things have passed away. God is going to fulfill his kingdom promises to the Jewish people and to us. He's going to establish the throne of Jesus in a literal but renewed Jerusalem, and ultimately the whole earth is going to become the tabernacle of God. What greater joy, what a tremendous feast. But here's the catch. And I want you to think about this. Only those that have entered into a relationship with him by believing that Jesus is the Messiah are going to participate in that. The others are going to be removed from that celebration. And so I want you to take time tonight, these next days as we hear about maybe on the news or see. I don't, growing up, I lived in a more of a Jewish community than I do now, and so sometimes I'd see the sukkahs of my neighbors and things out. But think about these feasts and these tabernacles. Think, take time. Take the appointed time. Think about your relationship with God. Are you growing with him? Are there things that we need to repent of? This is the time, this, these days are called 10 days of awe between um, the Feast of Trumpets and then the Feast of the Day of Atonement. Jewish people are taking stock, they're taking inventory because they believe that there's a chance that their name may get into the Book of Life for the coming year, or it may not. And so they're trying to review that and figure that out. We don't have to do that, folks. We trust in the blood of Christ, the finished work. And I pray that that is true for you this night. Let me pray for us. Oh, Father, thank you that you knew that we are weak. We need visual things to keep reminding us of your great mercy. Thank you that your mercy is more, that though our sins, they are many, your mercy is more. Thank you, Jesus, for being an obedient son, willing to endure pain and hardship 
for our benefit and for our sake. Oh, Father, I pray that you would be merciful yet again to the people in this room, to our other friends, that you would bless them with an understanding of who you are, that they would grow in their understanding and their relationship with you, that they would develop a deep intimacy with you, not based on rituals, not based on fun things to do, but Father, based on that that they know you as Father. They know that you have forgiven their sins because they've trusted in the work of Christ. So I pray that that would be true for each one in this room. Lord, have mercy upon us tonight, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.